Five Point. Those of you that are viewing online, we just want to tell you thank you so much for tuning in with us. And if you're a first-time guest online or here physically, thank you, thank you. We consider it an honor for every time a first-time guest comes and worships with us. I want to say thank you to Pastor Mark for doing such a great job the last two weeks. So good. A lot of pastors don't have the... The, the gift of being able to go somewhere, to worship somewhere else, or just take some time off and, and know that everything's going to go as smoothly as it did. So, man, I'm just so proud of my staff and Pastor Mark for what they did. And then I want to say thank you to those of you that took part in our golf tournament. Not this past Saturday, but the Saturday before. Uh, we had our five-point youth golf tournament in order to uh, raise money for our summer camp. And it's the only thing we do. And I just think when we ask you to take a part of something, we should tell you what happened. We raised for our five-point youth summer camp over, listen, over $30,000. Yes, sir. So every one of you that sponsored a hole or just gave a gift or, or played in the tournament, we, we just want to say thank you. Now, I haven't spoke on this stage in two weeks, so buckle up. I am ready to rock and roll. So who's ready to hear a word? Man, would you just repeat after me, Holy Spirit? Let me to hear this word so I can receive this word so I can go and live this word. Everybody said? Amen. Let me see him. I got my Bible, Pastor. Got my Bible, got my Bible. Good job, good job, good job. If you're a first time guest and you don't have a Bible, just read the words on the big screen. But we believe here God's people ought to have God's word in God's house. And if you need one, go to Connections after the service and we'll give you one free. Now, take your Bibles, turn to Romans 8. And then we'll kind of be going back to 5, 6, 7 just before. But you need to get your string at Romans 8. Now, as you're turning there, I ask you the same question I ask every week. It's not about do you just have a Bible, do you read it? Pastor, I've read my Bible every day since last Sunday, if that's you. Let me see you. Come on, come on. Good job, guys. Good job. Stay in God's Word in a great way. I need to ask this as I get ready to move forward. How many of you have been at Five Point for five plus years regularly? Okay. If you've been here that long, you've heard me share this story before, but it bears repeating because of it's setting up where we're going to be going for the next few weeks as we start a new series. So if you've heard this, just kind of bear through it with me if you would. And if you haven't, here we go. I wore my a Clemson shirt because of the description of a practice that I want to share with you. This is the field that we practiced at when I was at Clemson. Now you're thinking, the picture looks like it should be in black and white. It wasn't that long ago, all right? And this is the practice field, and we had the moat around it, and then we, we, we didn't have all the stadium that we have now. In fact, my uh, freshman year, they just started the other side of the upper deck. But anyway, the offensive linemen usually practiced right in front of that great big tower. And up in that tower was a camera, and we called it the big eye in the sky. They videotaped every practice. But also, Coach Ford spent a lot of time up in that tower because he could look and see the practice of the offense, he could see the defense, he, he could see the kicking team, because we different areas all around that practice field. Linemen hated Tuesdays and Wednesdays a lot of time because we did this thing called middle drill. Middle drill is where they would take the offensive line, or the, the offense, and then they would take the defensive line, and then the linebackers, no defensive backs, and they called it middle drill because we running straight at you. So the defensive line knew that we were not going outside. We're coming at you. We're not going to pass. We're coming straight at you. And this day, Coach Ford was upset, which was normal, and he did one versus one. In other words, first string against first string. And, and he usually didn't do that. It was usually first string against second string, you know, offense, defense. But this day he was ticked. I'm at left tackle, and I'm going against one of the most phenomenal athletes that I ever had the honor to play against. His name was Michael Dean Perry, William Perry's brother. And he's at defensive tackle. And they called the play, and, man, I ran up to the huddle, and, I got down on my, got my stance, and I'm leaning forward a little bit more because I know that, that, that on the snap, I, mean, I'm, 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 I know exactly who to go get. And it wasn't Michael Dean. It was the linebacker because the tight end's going to come down and crash on him because we're running to the right side because the defensive end can't get there. So I know I got to dip that left shoulder. I got to get to the linebacker and make a great block. Well, the snap was on two. And the count at Clemson at that time was blue 18, blue 18. So that hot, hot. So you go on two. Blue 18, blue 18. said so hot, hot. Snap of the ball, man, I took off, j just put my shoulder on my offensive guard, dipped that shoulder, got to the linebacker, hit the linebacker, knocked him backwards. It was great. But for some reason in the backfield, I heard pow. And I thought, oh, someone's about to get chewed out. 
because I just made a great block. And the next thing I heard was Coach Vander Hayden as he grabbed my face mask, ripped me around. He only came to about right here, pulled me down to him, spit going everywhere in my face, telling me how stupid I was. And me, I'm like, seriously, Dean, you said this? I said, Coach, I did block the right guy. I'm telling the line, Coach, I blocked the right guy. And he's hammering me. Coach Ford from above says, run it again for Herman. Run to the huddle. And the other guy's like, come on, Dean, you got this. Okay, you know who to block. Well, again, it's on two. Now, the whole defense knows the play. They know exactly where the ball's going. I got Michael Dean Perry in front of me. I got my weight forward. Blue 18, blue 18, set, hot. I went on one. They are hammering me because, once again, Coach Ford hollers from the heavens above, Herman, you moron, run it again. So I get back, and I am so flustered now because everybody in the huddle is like, come on, man, because the entire defense knows where we're going. They're keyed up, and they're wanting to make a good play, and they know exactly what we're running. It makes it that much harder for the offensive line. We get up to the, the line again. I'm not making this up, guys. Now I'm focused with Michael Dean going on two. They called the play. Blue 18, blue 18, set, hot, hot. I went and got the linebacker. Blocked the wrong man again. Because now I'm focused on making sure I get out. Vander Hayden comes over to me, grabs my face mask. He lights into me. And Coach Ford from the heavens above hollered, Herman, you moron, do you know it or not? I was so upset at myself, my team, and I promised myself, this will never happen to me again. I'll know that playbook, right, left, backwards, upside. I'll know every position if I have to. After practice, and we'd run our sprints, because you ran sprints on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, we get done, and Vanner Satan says, Herman, come here! And I'm, I'm not making this up. I remember like it was yesterday. I made the decision. If he starts cussing me out, I'm going to whoop his tail all over this field. I will lose my scholarship. I will never get the opportunity to play football again. But he will. I, I was, have you ever been so mad you're shaking? I was so, because I was mad at myself and the situation. I mean, I'm wanting to excel. And Herman, come here. So we get over there, and it's like his entire demeanor changed. So when I got over to him, he said, it's kind of like a father now. He said, Dean, take a knee. I take a knee, a knee and I got my hand on my helmet. And kind of like a dad. He said, Dean. Since you've been here, you've gotten so much bigger, so much stronger. Because I came in at 6'6", 240, and at this time I'm 6'6", 300. It didn't look like it does now, okay? It, 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 it's a different 300, all right? I weighed 284 this morning. And, and, but anyway, it's going to happen to you too. Yeah, you can act all big and bad. It's going to happen to you too, all right? He said, Dean, you've gotten so much bigger. You've gotten so much stronger. Man, at that time I'm benching 400. I'm squatting 700. I'm, 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 my dreams are coming true. He said, but it doesn't matter how big you get or how strong you get if you don't know who to block. And that analogy, after I got saved, made me think. I wonder if God the Father from above has ever thought to his players, do you know your playbook or not? Because if Coach Ford would have brought me into his office and said, Dean, what do you want at Clemson University? I'd have told him, I want to be the greatest athlete that I can because I want to play professional ball. I want, and he would have told me the things that I needed to do. And for so many in here, I know your heart is, God brought you into his office and said, what do you want in your walk with Christ? I don't think a lot of people, because you've been here so long with me, would say, well, I just want to go to heaven. Because you know, heaven ticket ain't it. I think a lot of you would say, well, I want to be everything God wants me to be to excel on his team. But you can't do that if you don't know the playbook. Right. And truth being told, man, we're just, we're, just, we're just talking here. For a lot of you in here, you're not even sure if you're on the team. Because I can promise you, when I strapped up and put all that stuff on and started walking on the field, I knew I was going to war because someone out there is wanting to hit me as bad as I'm wanting to hit them. Amen. I knew I was on the team. Had the name on the jersey, Herman. I knew when I ran down the hill whose I was, where I was, and what I was about to do. And for a lot of you today, as we jump into this series, do you know it or not? 
I want it to be just kind of like we're having a conversation at lunch. Now, let's look at it this way. There's my two grandsons, Hudson and Grayson. Let's say one of them came up to me and said, hey, Big Daddy, how do I know if I'm saved or not? And with all the love that I have for them and all the love that I have for Christ, that's a great question, Hud. That's a great question, Gray. Let me answer that question for you. Because before you can move forward, you've got to know if you're on the team or not. Amen. So for the next few weeks, we're going to talk about, are you on the team? Do you know your playbook? Do you really know how to repent of sin? And do you really have a desire to be bold for Christ? Do you know it or not? Father God, I come to you right now with a broken heart for the place that the American church is today. And pray as we start with the very simple question, how can I know for sure that I'm saved? God, that you speak to hearts in a very, very real way. And I just pray this in your holy, sweetly name. Amen. If you've been here any length of time, you've heard me say it 100 times, April 12, 1987, Green Sea Baptist Church, 1205. I walked the aisle, I gave my life to Christ. And have never doubted since if he is my head coach, if you will. But for a lot of you, it wasn't, it's not that, no doubt. So just being honest. It's just me and you. We're at lunch. We're talking. You're asking me the question. How many of you would admit that since the day you say that you got saved, you've doubted this Jesus stuff. You've doubted if you were ever really saved or not. Raise your hand real quick. Look around. I mean, with church this large, with this many people, and you've raised your hand like that? Take your Bibles. And I want to talk to you today about, man, are, are you sure? Are you really on the team? And, uh, take your Bibles up to Romans 5. And you've got Romans 8 also. And remember, the Apostle Paul's in Corinth. And he's writing a letter to the small church in Rome that he's, he's never even been a part of it. Because he's got word that the church in Rome has had some division. And we've talked about this, but the emperor has kicked out all of the Jews out of the city of Rome. So now you've got these small group of Gentiles running the church. Then after three or four years, the emperor allowed, the Caesar allowed the Jews to come back into the city. They go back to the same church and they say to the Gentiles, what have you done? You're doing this all wrong. So Paul writes this book <clears throat> called Romans up to the church to explain to them that the salvation is not just for the Jews and it's for everybody. And through this, he explains how we can really know. So... We're in Romans 8, but would you just turn your Bible very quickly over to Romans 5? And if you have the ESV Bible, like I do, what does Romans 5 say for your heading? Very good. Peace with God through faith. Peace with God through faith. Read Romans 5, 1 with me. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, I've taught you this. What does justified mean? Just as if I'd never sinned. Your sin has been justified because of the cross. When you get to Romans 8, what the Apostle Paul is doing is he is giving you a quick summary of chapter 5 in 8.1. Look at 8.1. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The cross took our sin. And he's showing that to you. You don't have to walk around wondering, am I going to be held accountable for this sin? No, the cross took it. Back to Romans 6. Romans 6. What is your heading in Romans 6? Dead to sin, alive in God. Well, if I'm not held accountable to sin, why not just go sin all I want? Because people ask that. So the Apostle Paul answers that for us. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? No, you don't want to continue to sin because you've been radically changed by the blood of Christ. Romans 8, 2. For the law of the Spirit has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. No, no. It's not that you can sin. It's that you've been changed and you no longer want to sin because you want to live for him. So now he has summarized chapter 5. He's chap summarized chapter 6. Romans 7. What's your heading say for Romans 7? You got it. It says... Raised from the law. If you remember, the Old Testament, the law, is the picture of Christ. The New Testament is the person of Christ. We're not living by the law anymore. We're living in the new covenant because of the Lamb, the perfect unblemished Lamb, God the Father, Son, Christ. Romans 7, 1 says, Or do you not know, brothers, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, the Jews, remember this church up in Rome, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. 
So he's trying to explain to the Jews back in Rome, yeah, you guys know the law, but we're not living by that anymore. All right? Back to Romans 8, verse 3, where he just summarized chapter 7. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending, in his, own, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. Then you get to Romans 8. What's the heading in Romans 8? Life in the Spirit. We're completely different now because the Holy Spirit dwells inside us. So Romans 8, 4, he's kind of giving us a summary of where he's about to go in Romans 8. Romans 8, 4 says this. In order that the righteous requirements of the law, okay, in order to be justified, just as if I'd never sinned, you had to sacrifice, you had to live by the law. That's the picture of Christ. Now we're in the New Testament, the covenant of law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh. Here we go, here we go. But according to the, to the Spirit. So in other words, now that you're saved and the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you, because here's the problem in the American church. Just, just sharing my heart. So many people in the American church, especially the Bible Belt, remember vacation Bible school. How many of you as children went to vacation Bible school? There we go, there we go. Bunch of Baptists in here. When I mean, we went to vacation, yeah. And the parents took you. They didn't care if they, about Jesus. They just, wanted to, they just wanted to get rid of you for a few hours during the day, all right? But I can remember, you know, I was, had the flannel board. My mom took me even in California, vacation Bible school. And I can remember that woman saying, how many of you, you know, were six, seven years old, five years old? How many of you want to go to hell? There ain't nobody going. I do. I mean, unless you're little Johnny over there and you got the weed in your pocket and earrings and nose rings. I mean, no kids like, I want to go to hell. But then the teacher would say, well, how many of you, you know, want to go to heaven? So what did every kid in there do? I do. So obviously because you raised your hand because you didn't want to go to hell, then grandma wanted to make sure you got baptized. The next week you did. And you're good. You're saved. And there's been no life change whatsoever. Amen. Nothing. Amen. But you will say, well, I got saved because remember back in vacation Bible school. That's right. And Paul says, no. No. Well, then how, how do I know I'm saved? Back to Romans 8. Now he starts in chapter 5, talking for those who have truly been indwelled by the Holy Spirit. Because, you know, so many years we've heard, well, if you want to go to heaven, ask Jesus to come into your heart. Well, it's not Jesus. There's God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and then the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that begins to dwell in you. Romans 8, 5 says, for those, don't get mad at me, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. And so when it says, set their minds on the things of the flesh, literally what it's saying is, these are the things that people who don't know Christ, who don't have the Holy Spirit, think about. So I got to thinking and just started writing down some stuff. The mind set on the flesh. For people who don't have the Holy Spirit, these are the things that you really think about a lot. So let's kind of go through these real quick. Selfish desires. Everything's about me. Everything in this world is about me. But when the Holy Spirit comes in us, it begins to help us understand it's no longer about me, it's about him. I'm so sick and tired of hearing people who claim to be Christians say, well, it's my body, I'll do what I want. No, it's not. Well, it's my life. This is what I'm going to do with it. No, it's not your life. You said you gave your life to Christ. He has the, he has the right to do what he wants with it. That's right. Well, this is my body. I'll sleep with who I want. No, you won't. Unless you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. That's right. So what do we think about that are, you know, don't have the Holy Spirit. We envy. You want what everybody else has got. You want your spou their spouse. You want their job. You want their money. You, you envy. You covet. Kids. Now, I'm not saying that thinking about your kids is wrong, but Matthew 10 is very clear. If you love your kids more than you love me, you can't be my disciple. And for some of you, your kids are your God. So you think about them constantly. The phone. I get, I, I'm so tired of talking about the phone. But when you pick your phone up and you stare at it for hours, are spiritual things coming out of the phone. And people say, well, I got my Bible on the phone. Well, look at it then. But you don't. You're looking at fleshly things for hours because that's what your mind thinks about. The American church is consumed with money. Money. I just want to make more money. Even though the Bible says, be happy with what you got. Make more money. Make more money. Why do I want to make more money? Because it's all about me. I just want a better life. Money. Lust. 
You see someone from the opposite sex, and all you can think about is undressing them and what you want to do with them. American church is addicted to pornography and to the lust of the flesh. Judging others. You know why we judge others? Because, you know, our sin is just not that bad. But their sin? We ain't going to look in the mirror. I'm so tired of the American church always saying that they're the victim and never the villain. Sports. Man, we know our sports. We love our sports. We talk about our sports. We take part in sports. We teach our kids sports. Again, it's not that it's all wrong, but it's the things that we think about constantly, but they're fleshly things. TV. And when I say TV, I mean Netflix or Prime or Apple Plus or Hulu or whatever all those stations are. I talk about some of the series that I watch, but it's like all we can think about are those fleshly things. Pride. Well, look how good I am. Well, God would never do that to me. Well, I'm, I mean, we got to talk about food. Man, you'll be sitting at lunch asking where we're going for dinner. It's like you're consumed with food. Why do we have so many fat people in the American church? Because we're consumed with food. Is that fair, church? How about idols? We've talked about this. It's the things that you love, that you worship, things you spend your time, your money, your thoughts on. That's what he's saying. What do you think about all the time? Social media. You make a post, and for the next three hours, you look at it every 10 minutes to see what somebody puts on there. You're consumed with what people are thinking about you. That's why you put all that stuff out there. And can I be honest with you? Ain't nobody cares what you had for dinner last night. Nobody cares! Entertainment. Our entertainment has gotten so ungodly that we don't even have a problem with it anymore. It's of the flesh. And I cannot leave out me. Everything seems to always be about me. It's never become about him using me to reach them. Our vision statement is very clear. Reach and teach. Reach people to love of Jesus, teach them how to love like Jesus. But you never even think about helping reach other people. Why? Because it's all about me. Those are the things that the flesh thinks about all day long. Let's keep going, keep going. Romans 8, 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds, that's what they think about, on the things of the flesh. Now listen, listen, listen. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit has come into your life and he has changed your thinking. You're no longer consumed with thinking of the things of the flesh, but you begin to think of the things of the Spirit. So, Pastor, what are some of the things of the Spirit? Glad you asked. Let's talk about that. Prayer. Come on, guys, let's just be honest. It's like pulling teeth to get some of you to go on and come pray at the church. And that's because you don't even think about prayer unless you're in trouble and you need God to get you out of trouble. And then your prayer life is, go, God, I need this. If you'll get me out of this, I'll never do it again. You get out of it. Three days later, you're right back at it. Your character. What you look like behind closed doors. Well, you ain't worried about what God thinks about it. You're just worried about what man thinks. So you do what you want because you think no one's watching. But the spirit filled person cares about their character. Raising your kids to love the Lord. Well, we got them here, don't we? Yeah, but a lot of you won't be back for four or five weeks because you got an AU ball. You got all these things that your kids are doing. And then when 20 years from now, when they don't make loving Christ a priority, you ask God, why aren't my kids? Because you taught them not to love Christ. Why don't my kids enjoy reading the Bible? Because they never saw you reading the Bible. Humility. Now, if you think about the American church, are church people humble? Think about worship. Do, do you try to worship God throughout the day? Or is it, you know, you come in here, you listen to a few songs, you come to church and gone. What about generosity? Giving should be one of the greatest characteristics of the American church, of any body of believers. You don't want to give except to your own kingdom. 
loving others. I ain't talking about your spouse or your kids. I'm talking about the person you hate. Why would I love them? Because God said, I don't know you by the way you love people. Here we go, here we go. Reading your Bible. If you truly are a child of God, why don't you want to be in the Word of God? I went and memorized that playbook. Started having Debbie help me. Say, she didn't have a clue. But Okay, on this play, this is who I go block. And she said, well, the line goes to this person. That's the one. That's the one. Because I wanted to be the greatest I could be for the team. If you're a child of God, why would you not want to be the greatest you can be for the team? And it starts by being in the Word of God. Amen. Evangelism. Reach and teach is who we are. Reach people, then teach them how. And you do that by reaching, by sharing the gospel. When's the last time you even thought about sharing the gospel with somebody? Serving others. There's still so many of you, you come in here every week. You come, you sit, you leave, and you expect to be served. But heaven forbid you help serve others. Do you think about building your kingdom in the flesh constantly? Or are you consumed with thinking about building his kingdom? Building his kingdom should be what we are consumed with. So think about those lists. Do you think more about fleshly things all day long when you get home? Or do you think about spirit-filled things? Back to Romans. Romans 8, verse 6. He said, for to set the mind on the flesh, for to think about that fleshly list all day, for to set the mind on the flesh is death. Now, when he says death here, what's he referring to? You know this. Spiritual death. So in other words, he literally just said, if you think about fleshly things all day, you are lost. That's right. I didn't say it, he did. You're lost. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the spirit, listen, 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 is life and peace. You know why so many of you, so many American Christians are miserable? Because you think about fleshly things all day long. You can't get the life and peace that thinking about Holy Spirit-driven things can give you. This is not my life, it's his. You have every right to do what you want with my life, God. I love the way Philippians says it. The Apostle Paul, in prison, said it this way. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellent... If there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And I've told you before, when I got saved, the greatest challenge of change was right there. So why? Why should we think about spiritual things? Why? Instead of flesh. Look at verse 7. For the mind that is set on the flesh, think about those fleshly things, is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it can not. It can't. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You can't do it. And the reason that so many people are consumed with the fleshly list is because the Holy Spirit has never came and indwelled inside of you. And if the Holy Spirit's never came and dwelt inside of you, then you can't think about spiritual things. It's not possible because you don't have the Holy Spirit. So how do you know if you're radically saved? How do you know if you've ever really fallen in love with Christ? How do you know? Has the Holy Spirit ever came and began to dwell inside of you? Romans 8, 9 says this. You, however, those of you, those of you that got radically changed, those of you that fell in love with Christ, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. And Paul had the same problem we have today. People saying they were, he said, if, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, because anyone who does not have the spirit of God does not belong to him. How can I know for certain? How can a pastor, how, on a, such a simple level, how can I be certain that I'm saved? How do I know I'm on God's team? Because the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. 
And when he comes and dwells inside of you, it changes everything. The Holy Spirit has several job descriptions. And very quickly, I want to give you five of the major job descriptions of the Holy Spirit. In other words, when the Holy Spirit comes and dwells inside of you, these things automatically happen because he is inside of you. And without him, these things cannot happen. Pastor, I know I'm radically saved. Then why don't you write these down so that when someone actually says, how can I know I'm saved? You don't go call Pastor Dean. What if you grew to the point that you actually helped other people? What if you started discipling others? What if you were so in love with God that these spirit things is what drove you? So here we go. How do I know I'm saved? The Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. What's the Holy Spirit's job description? Number one, conviction of sin versus comfortable with sin. Conviction of sin. Let's just be honest, guys. Are there th- sins that are fun? Well, you ain't sin like I have. Are there some sins that are fun? All right, let me give you a good example. I'd love to put a snow plow, plow in the front of my truck, and if somebody's doing 50 in a 70, I'd love to plow them off the road, especially when they're staring at their phone. Would that be sin? So I probably don't need to do that, right? And we can be very serious, but there's things that you'd love to do, but you can't. And you know, the problem here is that so many of you have become so comfortable with your sin that there's no longer any conviction of it anymore at all. A couple weeks ago, I showed you the Queen James Bible, and there was a gasp. (gasps) And in the Queen James Bible, there's eight verses that they would call homophobic verses, and they took them out of the Bible so that, you know, those homophobics, you know, that's not real. We can live the way we want. How is it any different for those of you in this room who refuse to tithe? You have become so comfortable with your sin that there's no longer any more conviction. What's the difference between those of you that are shacking up with someone? There's no conviction. You're just very comfortable with what you do. What about you're so fat you can't do what God wants you to do? Heaven forbid we talked about that. And there's no conviction about it because you're so comfortable because the church no longer wants to talk about it. You know why so many of you don't serve? Because you think there's nothing wrong with it. Because there's no conviction because you've become so comfortable with your sin. It is impossible to say you're a child of God and not have conviction of sin. Can't do it. You cannot do it. Number two, conscience. Your conscience. I want you to read the definition of conscience. An inner feeling or voice viewed as acting as a guide to the rightness or wrongness of one's behavior. An inner voice. You know what that inner voice is called? Holy Spirit. Spirit. Now, if you're old like me, do you remember those commercials of the good angel, bad angel? The bad angel saying, do it, do it, do it. And the good angel saying, don't do that. You know it's wrong. You know it's wrong. But the problem is, it's like the good angel's not even there. Because there's no Holy Spirit to convict you of this sin, so your conscience doesn't even make you feel guilty about doing that anymore. It's just part of who you are. Because we all know that, you know, you and God got a deal, and he doesn't care about your sin. He's completely comfortable with you living that way. Romans 8, 12 says this. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. Notice verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. What's he mean by die? Not physical, but a spiritual death. But if the spirit But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, the conviction makes us say, man, I've got a struggle in this area, but I want to make changes because the conviction is eating me up. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die, but by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Conviction of sin. You can't be a child of God without conviction. You cannot be a child of God if there's not not some voice, your conscience saying, this is wrong, I shouldn't be doing this. Number three, comprehension of God's word. 
You know why so many of you don't want to read your Bible every day? You can't. You don't have the desire inside of you to read it. Because the Holy Spirit is the only thing that's going to draw you to make you want to read God's Word. People say all the time, well, Pastor, I just, I don't understand it. Beep, 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 beep. And so it's not, I don't understand it. I don't want to read it. Well, 1 Corinthians 2.14 tells us why. The natural person, the person that doesn't have the Holy Spirit, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. For they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. You don't have the Holy Spirit to help you understand the Word of God or draw you to want to be in the Word of God. I don't get up at 5 o'clock, 5.30 every day of my life and read the Bible for a couple hours because I have to. No, because I want to. Because I'm in love with the King. This is his love letter to me. I want to be drawn closer to him. And it comes here. Well, I don't want to read the Bible. There's probably a reason for that. The Holy Spirit's not there drawing you to the Word of God. I don't want to memorize the Bible. There's probably a reason. It just doesn't ever make sense to me. There's probably a reason. What's the Holy Spirit's job description? It's conviction of sin. You cannot be comfortable with your sin. Number two, you have that inner voice, your conscience saying, don't do it, don't do it. It is so wrong. Number three, comprehension of God's Word, understanding it, wanting to be in it. Number four, conversation with Christ. People say to me all the time, I just, I just don't like to pray. I just don't know how to pray. Well, you know, before you had a child, you didn't know how to talk to babies. But as soon as that child came out, oh, you knew how to talk to that baby. You, know, you didn't know how to talk to a wife before you got married. But as soon as you got married, it is easy to talk to people you love. And so when you fall radically in love with Christ, prayer comes naturally. That's right. Here's a picture of someone I don't have a real good relationship with. <laughs> Hope he loses every game this year. Don't, don't, don't want to be a part of his team and don't want to have a conversation with him. Could the same be true with you and Jesus because you ain't part of the team? Because I promise you, when you fall radically in love with God, prayer comes naturally. Go to Romans 8, verse 28. It says this. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. So the Holy Spirit's job description is. He helps us. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. I don't know how to pray. Don't worry about it. He's got you. I don't know what to pray for. Don't worry about it. He's got you. But Pastor, I'm not. He's got you. But if you ain't got him, he ain't got you. The Holy Spirit will not allow you to be comfortable with your sin. It will convict you. It will give you a conscience so that that inner voice is speaking. It'll help you understand the Word of God. And it will take your prayer life to a place like it never has before. Number five. A Christ-centered life. Once you give your life to Christ and the Holy Spirit begins to dwell inside of you, you begin to realize it ain't about me. It's about Him using me to reach them. Reach and teach. That's who we are. That's what the Bible says we are. Five point. Man, the purposes are above the doors. You walk in, worship, evangelism, discipleship, ministry, fellowship. That's what the book of Acts is all about. The five purposes of the church. That's who we are, what we are. Because that's the purpose of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 28 says this. And we know that for those, only those who love God, all things work together for the good. The bad things, the ugly things, the good things, they all work for him because our life is Christ-centered. For those who are called according to his purpose. Probably one of the first verses that I ever memorized as a Christian was 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, whatever you do in your life, do it all for the glory of God. And that will never be prevalent in your life unless the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. You know the reason you live the life you do? Because you think about fleshly stuff all the time. 
Right now, the Holy Spirit's speaking to a bunch of people in this room. Because as I listed that stuff of the flesh, you said that, that that's all I think about. There is no spirit driven thought process. For a lot of you in this room, that vacation Bible school thing ain't holding up. Father God, I come to you right now with a broken heart for the state of the American church. God, we just want to go to heaven, but we don't want to live for you. So Lord, in a simple, simple way, the Apostle Paul told us exactly how to know that we're one of yours. It's when we get filled with the Holy Spirit and then the Holy Spirit will drive us to do these things. Every eye closed, every head bowed. Pastor, you're talking straight to me. I'm gonna make this as easy and simple as I can. You are not driven by the Holy Spirit. And if that's the case, you do not know Christ. And if that's the case, you do not have a relationship. Pastor, you're right today. I wanna change that. I want to become a child of God. I want to be a part of his team. If that's you, just raise your hand real quick and put it right back down. Hands up, hands down. Hands up, hands down. Hands up, hands down. Look at me. Like first service, there's hands. But here's the problem. You're embarrassed that somebody might think you're lost. That's why in Matthew 10, Jesus himself said this. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I'll acknowledge before my Father. In a room with this many people, if you're willing to say, I need to know Jesus, you are acknowledging before men in the house of God that you want to be a child of God. Before my Father who's in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I don't want no one to know, I'll also deny before my Father who's in heaven. So this is what we're going to do. We're out of time. If you need to know Christ, I'm just going to ask you to stand up on the count of three. Make your way to the back. Take your stuff. Head to our, our prayer room. And there's going to be people there who want to make sure that you come to know Christ, getting filled by the Holy Spirit to bring conviction of your sin, to bring a conscience to help you understand the Word of God, to help you have a conversation with God through your prayer and to have a Christ-centered life. Come on, church. Now, here's the truth. A lot of you ain't going to stand up. The first service laugh. Don't laugh at this. But if you're going to disown God here, you need to understand Then you don't have a relationship with Him. And without a relationship, it's straight to hell. So on the count of three, make it simple and we're done. Pastor, you're talking straight to me. I'm asking you to stand up, make your way to the back, and we're going to go nuts clapping for you. I need to get saved. Stand up and go. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you, dude. Anybody else? Last chance. Come on, church. Let's let them know how proud of them we are. They just stood up in front of a thousand people and said, I want to know Jesus. If that's the case, listen, listen to for everybody else in the room. You're saying that I know Christ, then that means you're Holy Spirit driven. So let's, let's finish. Another C, currency. That means you tithe, correct? That means that close to a thousand people here are going to tithe right now, right? Come on, man, really? Really? Why don't you tithe? Listen! Because you've become so comfortable with it that you don't even think you need to. Because, you know, you and God got this deal. No, no, you don't. Because it ain't your money. Whose is it, church? So I'm just asking you to give because you're in love. So if you're not all that, all that, all that, all would you give your currency because you're convicted to do so by the Holy Spirit? Most people don't even use the buckets anymore. And we just have a variety of ways to give, and the majority of it's online. If you're a first-time guest, I'm about to step off the stage with my wife. We're going to make our way to the VIP room. We just want to shake our hand, shake your hand, and tell you thank you for being here. And listen, listen, listen. Tuesday morning, it's 6.30. I'm going to encourage you. I know life will stop some of you, but most of you, you're just in the bed. Come pray. Prayer is not easy, but it takes you places you have no idea. Next week, I'm going to talk about how to know your playbook, how to study the Bible. And then for the next few weeks, I think on my podcast, The Point, that comes out on Wednesdays, I'm going to teach you how to do the things I'm going to share with you tomorrow. Because if you don't know your playbook, you cannot be God wants you to be. Now, we can put our heads in the sand and pretend that we don't have a very large Spanish-speaking population coming into Easley. But we do. 
Romans was written to the Jews saying, you're not the only ones who are allowed to come to know Jesus. We've been getting ready for it, and next week we're just kind of doing a soft launch. We're going to start in our third service, the Spanish-speaking translation. So we're not going to put them in another room and say, oh, you're not part of us. No, no. They're going to be back here with headsets as, as there's a translator speaking to them. In fact, if you go out, you can find cards. So you're like, I don't speak that. The card says it for you. All right? Just to say, I don't know if you go to church somewhere or not, and they look at you like, huh? Give them the card, and they're like, see? Si? Yes. We're here to reach everybody, right? White, black, brown, red, garnet. I don't care. We reach and teach. Start carrying these around. Start inviting those. <clears throat> if you're one of those that struggles with pornography, all you can think about is the other sex. I'm going to ask you to get signed up for our sexual integrity class that begins Tuesday. Got a bunch of women, but not a bunch of men. Why? Because it is difficult to admit that this is a problem in your life. But if the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you, you have the conviction of sin that will make you say, I want to make these changes in my life. Yeah. Next week, I'm going to teach you how to study your playbook. Bring a friend with you because you know they need it too. Thanks for being here, guys. See you soon.